Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel Airbus What's It Doing Now? Just a quick uh, intro for me before we get going with this episode and uh, just a quick uh, thank you for all those that have contributed to the channel uh, be it through buymeacoffee.com or through the Patreon uh, service. Uh, I'm extremely grateful it helps me improve the channel. I have since purchased a microphone, which I was hoping to use in this episode, but haven't quite got to the technical side of it yet to actually get it properly configured, but um, I'll get that sorted, I promise. Well, I hope you enjoy this episode. Please remember to like if you've liked it and uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, click the notification bell if you want to be notified of any future content. Thanks very much uh, for watching. Keep the plates spinning and uh, hope you enjoy the episode. I work for a legacy carrier and my company is seniority based. So it's about 10 to 12 years. So I think that's the right way to go about it. And that's when I know I'm ready for my command. I work for a regional or low cost, medium short haul operator. And at around two and a half to 3000 hours, we're invited for application. That must be when I'll be ready for command. How do I know I'm, I'm going to be ready? And what are the signs? Let's take a look at those things in more detail. Okay, so let's take a look at this then. We're in the command development, the command and ground school uh, series of videos here. And one of the things I wanted to have a look at is to understand when we think that we're ready. Now, I asked for a lot of, um, or I asked you for your input. I got a lot of it. In fact, very emotive subject, this. Lots of comments coming through um, from a, a wide uh, range of experience and from different airlines all around the world. So it was excellent, actually, to, to get this sort of input from you. A lot of it was obviously from your own personal experience, exactly what I wanted to see, ranging from legacy carriers uh, through to short and medium haul and, uh, and regional airlines. And the question here was, when are you ready? When is the best time to apply? When is the right time to make that step? And, and, and this is where the, the opinions very much differ. And it largely depends on you know, your own experience and uh, uh, the, the type of carrier that you fly for and their, their whole process. Um, but th there's still the question as to when you're ready, because it may well be that you're flying for a legacy carrier and you've been flying for 10, 12 years. And because it's based on seniority, that is when your number is up, if you like, or that's when your uh, number then gets highlighted. And that's your trip over the threshold as to when you can apply. But does that necessarily mean that you are ready uh, for command? I mean, that, that, that's the big question. One thing I've noticed here is I move my foot. The, the camera might wobble, so that could be another area we need to improve on. Um, so, so yeah, because you work for a legacy carrier, and because it's sort of 10 to 12 years, of course you've got lots of experience there and you've seen an awful lot. Um, does that mean that you're ready for command? Equally, uh, that's not the case of all airlines, and some actually might say between two and a half, three or four or 5,000 hours, whatever it might be, whatever your company uh, dictates, that actually that's the time that you apply but you haven't been in the right-hand seat for as long as somebody that has been in the right-hand seat for 10 or 12 years. So are you ready? Have you seen enough? Do you feel confident enough to make uh, that next step? And it is a difficult one. Um, and I'm gonna come on to some of the sort of the, the um, the, 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 the indicators uh, in, in a short while, because there's a common denominator through all of this, whether, you, whether you're four or 5,000 hours or whether you're seven, eight, nine, 10,000 hours, there's a common denominator through all of this. So the next question is, of course, is are you ever ready? Um, and that's not the battery. Uh, some people say that you never feel quite ready. Um, I don't believe that. Um, I believe you do know when you're ready or you certainly have a feeling of when you are ready and when you're ready to make that next step. Clearly, you're not going to be a first officer and then just jump into the left hand seat and be great at it. You're not just going to not need a command course. You're not just going to fly through it. It's going to be plain sailing. When you're assessed for your command, you're assessed of somebody that hopefully won't need too much work. Um, hopefully, shouldn't struggle through a command course 
and should complete it within the time allowed um, and get to a good standard before you actually um, are then sort of released to the line with line training, etc., etc. So that's what you're being assessed as, as whether you would find the command course um, too much of a challenge or whether you're ready for the command course. Not necessarily that you will be a great commander from day one. Okay, that, that, that's the big one here. But you do know if you want to make that next step because you'll have sat there in the right hand seat and you will have been in situations where you've, you've looked to the left and thought, yes, I could make a good job of this or I agree in the way in which this happens. So let's say, for example, you've had two go arounds at a destination, you've then diverted, um, you've landed at your ultimate with a teaspoon above final reserve. Um, once you've landed, the phone, captain's phone's going off from operations. You've got the cabin crew that are obviously concerned about what's happening, passengers, etc. So the captain gets up, he talks to his cabin crew. He then talks to the passengers, keeps them up to date, manages uh, his time with the dispatcher and the ground operations, and is also managing the expectations of operations, etc., flight time limitations, crew welfare, etc., and passenger repatriation, uh, and all of that sort of thing, as I, I always say, keep your plate spinning. So if you sat there in the right-hand seat, looked left and thought, God, I'm glad I'm in the right-hand seat, then maybe you're not quite ready to make that step. If you look left and thought, yeah, I, I, that's what I would have done. Or yeah, I've picked up some great tips there and I would feel comfortable if this was me, maybe I wouldn't have made it quite as clinical, but I, the, the moves that were being made and the uh, actions by the commander are exactly the kind of thing that, that um, I would like to see myself doing or I would be prepared to do. And I, and I think that's the critical thing. Um, so the signs there of you feeling ready is if you're looking left and thinking, yes, I could do that. Or if you're looking left thinking, no, I'm glad I'm where I am. And I, and I think that's a valuable sign. You'll see that as you go along uh, in, your, uh, in your training. So there, if you like the signs. So in, in answer to this, there is no right and wrong way of doing it, I believe. I don't think that you have a right to passage to the left-hand seat. And that's an important take home here. You may well have been in an airline for 12, 13 years and your seniority comes to the point where then you can look at taking command. I know there are complexities with it because you might have to change base or whatever fleet you're on and then you get to the bottom of the command, etc. All that take aside, I'm talking about specifically how you feel for command. So you might well have been there for, for a long time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're ready to make that next step. And equally, you may not have been in the right hand seat for as long as a guy in the legacy carrier, but that doesn't mean that you're not ready. You have to look inwardly and ask yourself that question in the experience that you have. Have you had enough experience to sort of to make that step? Like I say, it's not a rite of passage and not everybody will be ready at the same time. So we have to look inwardly at the sort of skills that are important. And this is where I come back to the sort of level playing field, or if you like the common denominator, no matter where you are in your career, is have you got the right skills? Um, have you got what it takes, okay? And you'll have been in those experiences and thought to yourself, have I got what it takes? Do I have the necessary command skills? Now, as we go through this course, we're gonna look very specifically at those skills, but I'm gonna to touch on them I'm going to touch on them now and so that you've got an area or the areas that you can focus on when you're asking yourself this question, am I ready? And it's all based around the soft skills. Now, this channel has been very much focused on the technical aspect. Now, as a first officer, you will be uh, expected to be technically proficient. Um, you should be able to fly the aircraft efficiently, both manually and through automation. And you should have a good knowledge of your company SOPs and procedures, uh, and you should have those pretty much nailed down. That's a given, okay? Before we go anywhere else, that's an absolute given. What we need to do now is look at those other skills that are necessary uh, for command. And it isn't sitting in the right-hand seat indefinitely. 
Because there comes a point where you're learning, and I'll, I'll show this in a minute, you're learning in your experience starts to tail off. It just does. And you get to the point where your peak and your efficiency, if you like, starts to tail off. And you, and you kind of need that next challenge. You can sit in the right-hand seat for 30 years and not see everything. You, you can't cover everything that you might see. I guarantee you, your first few months in the left-hand seat, you'll see things you've never seen before. So we have to look at these skills very carefully. Equally, you know, you, you haven't been in the seat for, for, for that long, but it gets to, or as long as 10 or 12 years, but it gets to a point where you're still starting to feel like you need that next challenge. And unless you make that jump, then you never join that curve. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, so I'll put a bit of context to this now and sort of show you what I mean visually. You've got the first officer and the captain. Uh, the timing you as a first officer, your experience on the, up on the left-hand side and your time down on the uh, bottom here. This is deliberately not giving any um, uh, value, okay? Because this time is, is, is the question that you need to be asking yourself. We'll come on to it uh, more in a minute, but I'm just trying to show, show you graphically what I mean, when it's the, the right time uh, without putting a number on it at the moment, because I don't want to do that. Um, and that's the whole point of this, uh, is to when is the right time in terms of when you know it, how you feel it, uh, to make the next step. Now, here we've got the experience on the left. So you first start out as a first officer, day one, just finished your, your line training, and you're now operating the line with a, with a uh, regular line cap in and the learning curve is almost exponential you know um and exhausting in the first uh, few months just as you get your feet under the table and you're trying to keep everything um balanced and trying to be as an efficient uh, first officer as as you can that learning curve is quite steep it comes a point after some time that actually that learning curve starts to sort of drop off and as you get more and more experience you become more and more comfortable there is a point here where that curve starts to drop off and actually you become more and more comfortable with the operation. And then you get to a point actually where you become arguably too comfortable. Then you become a little bit complacent. That might be the wrong word, but you, you start to lose that sort of um, um, motivation, you, you know where I'm coming from here. You get to the point as an FO where you're really comfortable. You're doing your job efficiently. You've given great support to the captain, but actually on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not really giving you the challenges that you had very early on. Clearly early on here is too early because you're still learning, okay? But it gets to a point here where this curve starts to drop off. What you don't want to do is get to this point there where you start to come on the, the back of the, the curve, if you like, and then it starts to have a negative effect. Now, you'll know when this is, and you'll know if you've been in the right-hand seat now, you just think to yourself, look, I'm, I'm ready to make this jump. I, I believe now I'm the right time. This is the area that you want to be looking at, the point at which you're comfortable as a first officer and you'll now feel like you've learned sufficient, you've got sufficient experience now um, to think about ready to make that move. Because this is where you want to hit it, because as you get towards the, your left-hand seat and you're then operating the line on the left-hand seat, that curve then goes shooting up again. And I firmly believe, although you never stop learning as a first officer, there's always room to learn more. You really learn when you're a captain. I mean, you really do. The experiences and the, the gravity of the left-hand seat, which we'll come on to later on in the subject, really means that you're constantly developing because of your responsibilities and your universal-wide responsibilities. You, you, you're learning a lot and you're learning very quickly and that curve, okay, it's not exponential, but in my view, in my opinion, that that keeps climbing. So you want to hit it at the right point where you, you, you're not too early and you're not too late. You make this jump and then you start learning. You then start that journey then as a commander. Hopefully that kind of makes sense for you. Okay, I hope you can uh, see this. Uh, okay, this is the skill set um, 
triangle, if you like, uh, and these are the uh, competencies, if you want, for a better word. Uh, your company will probably have something similar to this. This is what I'm used to, so it's uh, what I'm going to deliver to you today. But it'd be broadly along the same thing when we're looking at sort of evidence-based training. If that means nothing to you at the moment, don't worry about it. It's training competencies rather than training actual procedures so that you're then prepared to deal with anything. Now, this is really particularly important when we come to um, the, the command uh, ground school and the command course and your command journey as a commander. Because actually, many of these skills are very, very important. Now, I spoke earlier on about the sort of common thing, the common denominator in this. Um, like I said earlier on, um, it's a given that you you can fly the aircraft and your procedures and your knowledge actually should be unquestionably uh, sound. So this is like the skill set triangle, basically, and it's built in, it's split into three parts, behaviour, skill uh, and knowledge. And if you like, it's kind of the fire triangle. You'll remember uh, being at school, you needed um, air, you needed uh, heat source and you needed an ignition in order to make the fire go. Take any one of those out uh, and then, um, or the fuel I think it is, take any one of those out uh, and uh, it will break down. And it's exactly the same as, as, as the uh, skill set triangle, as it were, in terms of competencies. It works in a very, very similar way. You'll find that some of the behaviour, CRM skills will be able to support the flight path and application of procedures. But if any one of these breaks down severely, then the triangle breaks down, and that's where we start uh, as to break down the operationally. So here at the bottom, we've got the skill sets, which is your ability to fly the aircraft manually or fly it through automation, and your knowledge of your application and procedures and uh, your technical knowledge. These areas here are a given. Uh, and so we have to be proficient in this even before we even start considering moving on. Quick uh, voice over here, workload management, situational awareness, communication, problem solving, decision making and leadership and teamwork. These are the things that you will have been developing right the way from when you were an early first officer. Remember that sort of steep learning curve. And as you start to then gain more and more experience, you will be developing all of these skill sets. But these ones in particular is where you, you need to then start focusing on before you move into the left-hand seat, because these are the biggies. These are the common denominator in when are you ready for a commander, regardless of how long you've been in that right-hand seat or arguably how little you've been in that right-hand seat. It's whether you've got these competencies tucked away, uh, and I'm gonna talk about them in more detail in just a moment, um, as to whether, you are at the right time uh, to move on. So like I showed you that curve earlier on, in that green band is kind of where you want to be. At that time frame is where you want to be and you want to be very conscious of these competencies now and have them pretty much squared away. I'm going to talk about them in a minute, okay, I promise. But before I do, this is where you have to be super honest with yourself. Because if you haven't got these competencies squared away, it's really going to show. And it's going to show in the command course and it will show later on when you move seats. Now, you will be doing a lot of learning uh, as you go through the, 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 the process of command and as, as a commander. And you will be developing these, no doubt about it. You'll be developing everything because we constantly learn, don't we? Um, but these particular skills are the ones that really come to the fore. So let's take a look at them individually and then you can ask yourself the question, are you ready? You'll have training reports from your airline and it may be highlighting some of these areas here that you could then focus on uh, when it comes to your next um, simulator assessment. Sure, your airline will probably want two or three good training reports. But if you are at the sort of standard, you'll still need to look inwardly and say, you know, I find these areas most challenging um, or I'd like to find a way that I can better manage myself in these particular areas. So, so this is where you've got to look really inwardly and it's, it's not always something that your company can give you a specific targeted uh, guidance on. They certainly can help you in development and your training, but they don't know that until you're sort of honest with yourself. 
And if there are any areas that want to develop, then they're the sort of things that you want to be focusing on in your next uh, simulator assessment. If you've got time at the end, if your company uh, allows some time in, in the, your uh, recurrent uh, sessions to allow you as a first officer to sort of develop these skills, then that's a perfect time to do it. Also, whilst you're out in the line, once you're approaching that sort of green band, um, they're the times that you want to discuss these sort of things with your, with your commander. And when you are in those sort of tricky uh, situations, look left and see how it's being managed. See what assistance that you can offer. Make some of these suggestions and just kind of mentally put yourself uh, in that position. And that will really, really help you. OK, I'll talk to you long about this. Let's have a look at these uh, specifically and see how it, why, they, why they are important in helping you decide when you're ready. OK, guys, so we're going to look at these in a little bit of detail now in helping you decide where, when, when you're ready. As we go, as, as I mentioned earlier on, as we go through the course, we're going to look at more specifically why these are important and how we use these skills when we come on to things like diversion planning, um, etc., etc. The gravity of these will become um, more apparent, if you like, when we work through some examples as we move through the command course. But I wanted to touch on this well, actually, I wanted, to, I, wanted to, I wanted to more than touch on it. I really wanted to um, sort of give you a feel for the gravity of, of just how important these uh, competencies are. Because I think in the past, some years ago, before we really identified the importance of what makes a, you know, a good pilot, um, it, we broke sort of competencies down into sort of four main areas. Whereas now, the importance of those now carry so much gravity in because the environment that we're in has changed over the years um, and into much more of a sort of a management capacity. We need to be much more commercially sensitive than we ever used to be. We have to be more proficient. We have to be more technically uh, aware, but we also have to be more socially aware um, and how we uh, communicate with other people and various other services, etc., as the advancements on aircraft move further, move, um, get greater and greater, if you like, and more and more efficient and more and more reliable, um, our job as pilots then also changes uh, along with it. The environment is becoming much busier, the airspace is getting more complex, um, the operation is getting more complex, and as commanders, we need to be very much in tune with this. And some of these competencies now are becoming more and more, uh, they always were valuable, but they're more of a highlight now, I'd say the, gra the gravity um, needs, needs to be understood. One thing that is really important also before, before we go on to this, um, and some of the comments that I hear is about being you know, super efficient and super knowledgeable and you know, the, the, the captain has to know everything. That's a mistake, okay? That's a mistake straight away. So. We have to realise as human beings, you're never going to know everything. So, and I might have actually suggested this in the previous part of this um, episode, when we're talking about when you're ready. You don't have to know anything. You can't everything, anything. You have to know something. Uh, <clears throat> you can sit in that right hand seat forever and you'll not see everything and you will not know everything. You have to accept that. As a... As a captain, you are, if you like, a conductor of an orchestra. So uh, you've, you've seen those guys at the front with the, with the sticks pointing and doing all this kind of thing. No idea what they're doing other than they're conducting. And when he's doing all this, people are playing their instruments to, at, at time, um, and certain bars and certain parts of their music to coordinate with other parts in order to make this whole harmonic thing pull together and develop some, um, if you appreciate that sort of thing, great music. Um, but, but here's where I th the, the thing, the two parallels, um, or, or where the two things are, are parallel with each other in terms of command and conductor. The conductor can probably play each of those instruments, okay? So as a captain, you can do the first officer's job to a large extent, 
you've got a fair idea what the cabin crew are doing and the, and the cabin manager. You could probably pull together some sort of grand operation in, in, in terms of how the pushback works and loading of bags, etc. The dispatcher, you've got a fair idea of what they're doing, etc., 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 etc. There is absolutely no way you can do it all. OK, and you certainly can't do it as proficiently, arguably, as those individual people as the conductor of the orchestra can't play those instruments as effectively as all of those because they're doing it all the time. What your job is, is to pull all those things together and to make things start to sing. When they are meant to start and ensure that those instruments and those players and those musicians all come together seamlessly and with what seems to be very minimal effort. You've heard of the expression swans on a lake moving gracefully as they glide along the surface but actually what's going underneath is little legs are going ten to a dozen. That's what you want to achieve and that's where these competencies come in um, and put some sort of context to it. So don't make the mistake of thinking that as a commander you have to know everything and you have to do everything. Um, that's just not going to work and you're going to work yourself into an early grave. You, you are there to facilitate these services in order to achieve a proficient and safe operation. Okay. When I was a commander, um, I thought I was the best I was ever going to be. I thought I was God's gift to aviation and look at me, I'm going to show you how to do this. It became very clear to me very early on that I was not God's gift to aviation and there was absolutely no way that I was going to have control over everything and get everything the way that I wanted it to be. If I, if I wasn't able to actually use the resources around me and you learn that lesson very early on. OK, and it's important you learn that lesson very early on if you're going to be a successful commander. Right. OK, let's have a look at these. And as I say, I'm going to the more details we go through the course. Workload management. A, uh, oh, by the way, these aren't in, in order of priority. I've just written them up on the board as I, as I remember them. OK, so these are the areas that you want to sort of think about as you're approaching that sort of green band as when you think you might be ready to make that next step up to command. These are the areas that you want to be honest with yourself before you make that step. And between now and then, because let's be honest, there's probably not an awful lot of commands coming up at the moment because of the, of the, 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 the period that we're in. You probably might not be looking until next year now before that really takes care or, or maybe even uh, slightly longer than that. It depends on your airline and where you are. So use this time now to be honest with yourself about these areas that you might want to develop. Workload management. Are you calm, relaxed and not impulsive? It's very important. And, and we're not just talking about technical failures here, because actually a large part of your job as a commander won't necessarily be dealing with these horrendous failures that we've been talking about in the channel. But it will actually be people management. OK, it will be situation management, dealing with those situations. Like I said, when you were two go arounds and you and, and, and you land at your diversion with just about final reserve and managing all of the peripherals that go on around it, being the conductor of the orchestra. So if you're calm, you're relaxed and you're not impulsive, it means that you're taking in the information from from all around you in order to come up with a decision. I know it comes a little bit of a problem solving and decision making here. But if you are an impulsive and an irrational person where you jump to very early conclusions, that's something that you need to work on, because as a as a as a, as a commander, you're a leader. OK, and. You know, good leaders need to be calm and need to be relaxed, even in the most stressful situations. And that does take time to develop. Again, we're not born with this stuff. OK, we're not born natural um, um, leaders, if you like. So this takes time to develop. So workload management. Are you calm, relaxed and not impulsive? A really important quality for any pilot, but particularly for a commander. Situational awareness. This is a big one. This is a big one. Situational awareness, the way that I like to explain it to my trainees, particularly in the early days, is like you hold up a piece of A4 paper and you put a pinprick in, in, in the middle of the page. And when you start your career as an airline pilot, you're kind of looking through that little pinhole and the rest of it now is 
an opaque sheet of paper. You can kind of see what's going on, but you're, you're not situationally quite there yet, okay? And as you get more and more experience, you start punching a bigger and bigger hole into that piece of paper until such time as your situational awareness becomes a much wider field. Clearly, you don't want to be going into this process if your situation awareness is like a little pinprick. But as you start to broaden that up to the edges of that A4 piece of paper, that's when that, that's arguably when you're more ready. That, when you've got good situation awareness, you can see where the threats might come up. You can anticipate those and you can manage them more effectively. Problem solving and decision making, massive part of, um, of a successful command. And the pilot, because they're all pilot skills, but we're focusing more on making that next step. Seek relevant information, don't jump to conclusions, very much works in line with workload management. Like I said earlier on, you're not going to know everything, but there'll be lots of people around you that can help you make that decision, okay? You can facilitate an understanding of something by getting the questions out of these people in order to come to come to a conclusion. Sometimes it's actually quite useful to get somebody else to make that decision. I'm going to come on to this a little bit more later on as we move through the channel in terms of empowerment and that sort of thing. So if you can get somebody else to arrive at a decision and that's in line with your expectations and your line of thinking, that actually empowers that person because they feel that they've made the decision. That's a very really useful tool. We'll come on to that more a little bit later. So seeks well of information. Can ATC help you? Can your operations department or your technical department actually help you? Your first officer on the right hand seat there, has he, has he experienced this before or something similar? Has he been to this destination before where they've experienced similar problems? Have your cabin crew got experience of ground handling down at this place and really what to expect? Are there anything or is there anything in your company manuals that are going to help you with this and have you got time to consult them? Does the dispatcher hold any valuable information to help you with this passenger management situation? It can be really clear cut. We do this in the simulator all the time when there's an engine fire or something that will cause the rejected takeoff and then you use ATC, use the fire chiefs, etc. They're all pretty staged and fairly standard things. But as I say, I guarantee you that when you take the left hand seat, the first three months you'll see things you've never seen before. And you have a valuable, immensely resourceful members of your team and the peripherals uh, that can help you. So problem solving, decision making, seeking relevant information and don't jump to conclusions. It's very easy when you jump to conclusions to sort of make the situation fit and that you want to believe something because when we're uncomfortable about our surroundings, your brain, your chimp, I've done a whole subject on this chimp thing, but it's actually not available at the moment. I need to do some research, some rejigging with it, but um, I won't elaborate on that because it's going to go on forever. But your brain wants to hang on to something, it wants to hang on to something familiar. So if it looks like something, it's very easy to jump to it. And that's what you want to avoid. You want to use all the information, the resources around you to come to the conclusion and not make a situation fit. So if you're a sort of person that tends to jump to these conclusions, then that's something that you might want to work on. Communication. Communication, as I said, when we looked at failure management in one of my other videos, runs through everything. Being an effective communicator is absolutely vital in the role we do as pilots and particularly important as, as the commander. Is the person you're communicating with the right person to be communicating with? When you're giving information, are they ready to receive it? Are they capable of receiving it at that time? And how do you know that that message that you've given has been received properly and understood? Do you have some sort of feedback mechanism uh, to make sure? Are you perceptive or are you receptive to other people's point of view? So I was saying about a commander and having to know everything. You're not going to know everything. But if you don't, if you think you know everything and you're not listening to your, um, uh, your first officer, then clearly um, you're not using the maximum, uh, uh, effect, massive, uh, maximum effectiveness uh, of your resources. You're not going to know everything, so you're going to need to listen to people and you're going to need to understand their points of view. So when you're dealing with tricky situations down route um, and your cabin crew telling you one thing 
and you're thinking another, you, you, you need to uh, um, anticipate and understand their points of view and their questions that they might have so that you're much better able then to start making the decisions, coming back to that decision making process. Listening to other views and opinions. It's a, it's a very, very important skill. It's not one that comes to us all naturally. We might have our own idea. Um, but remember, particularly when we're talking about pilot monitoring, we need to empower the pilot monitoring. And if they don't feel as if they're being listened to, you're not going to get that full support. That's just human factors. OK, the last one then uh, before my throat completely dries out is leadership uh, and teamwork. Let's say not least of equal value, these um, creating an open atmosphere, involve others in planning, give direction and take responsibility. I've only highlighted just one of the performance indicators for each one of these. But there are many and we're going to talk about them in more detail. An open atmosphere. As a leader, you want to be approachable. You want to, for, for people to feel as if they can give you that contribution so that you can, you can conduct this orchestra more effectively. Because if you're not getting the feedback, then you're not going to be able to manage the situation as effectively. If people don't feel as if they can, can contribute, then you're probably not going to get the value of support uh, that you need. So we need to create that open atmosphere. We need to make people feel as if they're valued. You've also got to be able to take responsibility. And this is an, a, an important part of the job, is that ultimately it's the commander's responsibility. So you have to make that decision. And I've seen this done really well, and I've seen decisions not taken very well. I've seen situations where the cabin manager is desperate to get some leadership from the commander, and it's not coming. I've been sat there as a first officer in the early days in situations where we had long delays, and the commander hasn't been really feeding back information to the cabin manager. And... They've been coming in, you know, crying out for information, kind of looking at me and I'll, it's, it's been quite awkward, you know. Um, so people need leadership. So all of these soft skills in order to help us get to, a, to arrive at a situation where we've uh, considered all options, we've, we've invited uh, opinion and we've considered other people's uh, points of view. We've got good communication skills. Now we have to make a decision, but you've got to make it. It's not going to be made for you, OK? So you've got to stand up and say, right, this is what we're doing. And not to be afraid of doing that, because you know, let's be honest, you know, we're commanders at the end of the day and the company are giving you a 60 million pound jet with 200 passengers and they expect you to take it from A to B back to A again in complete safety no matter what the circumstances no matter what is going to happen down route unless there's something severely wrong with the aircraft or there's something severely wrong with your destination you're going to be going okay and the, the your company are relying on you to manage that flight safely and manage the passengers manage the crew and manage the whole environment to the point where the only thing that the passengers can possibly moan about is the fact that they've got a dry chicken sandwich they paid four quid for if you come out the end of your day and that's all your passengers are going to moan about you've done a really good job in situations where a decision has to be made it's as i say it's super important People are relying on you to do it. And as I say, I've seen it done well, I've seen it not done so well. In situations that I can remember, we've had to make some sort of difficult decisions. You think they're going to be difficult and you think they might not be popular. They won't always be popular with everybody. You can't please everybody all of the time. But you have to make a decision and you have to stand by it. And one of the realisations of a commander is that every decision you make has a consequence. No matter what we do, there will be a consequence to it. And what your job is to balance those consequences and, and choose, if you like, the laugh, like the least path of resistance or the path of least resistance. That's the right way around it. That's your job. And believe me when I say it, that once you make that decision, then actually you often see there's a relief because 
The crew will want a decision made because they want to move forward with it. The dispatcher wants a decision made. You might be thinking, well, what's the right thing to do? And as I say, it won't be right for everybody. But once you've made that decision and, you, and you've discussed it as a crew, and you move forward with that, then you start to see some relief on people. You know, you think, oh, right, well, at least, at least we know what we're doing. But you, you, know, you, you, you don't want to be dithering too long. Okay, so that, that leadership, that, that um, you know, uh, c c command decision-making is, is, is super important. Okay, right. So we're going to look at these in a lot more detail when we come on to various other aspects of the commander's toolbox and, and why these things are important in, in different scenarios. But hopefully this gives you an idea of really the sort of skill set that you want to be focusing on. Hopefully you realise that if you've been in the, the right-hand seat for 15 years, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a right to pass it to the left-hand seat. It doesn't mean just because you've got 5,000 hours, you're not ready for it either. It ultimately comes to how you feel inside. Clearly, you've got to meet the minimum criteria of your company, whatever that means, because you're not even going to get, you, your application is not even going to be reviewed. OK, and clearly you need to have a good training record and the lead up to it. OK, so all those things being equal. And you're in that sort of green band. These are the questions I believe that you need to ask yourself. OK, these are not exhaustive. There's just a few that I've picked out and we're going to be looking at these and others in more detail, as I say, later on. I think I've said that a dozen times now. I'm going to finish here now because I think I've said enough. It's hopefully this gives you a, enough information to sort of get chewing on now as we move forward to the uh, next few episodes in the, uh, in the uh, Command Ground School. Good. Thanks very much for watching. Keep the plates spinning and I will get a glass of water and talk to you again very soon.